So uh, welcome everybody to this year's actually first research seminar at the Institute for Future Studies. My name is Gustav Arenius, I'm the director here and a professor of moral and political philosophy. I'm very happy to start this series with Bo Rostein. Uh, he's, I guess, very well known for most people in Sweden, but um, also well known abroad, but I'll give a little introduction. So he's still and currently the August Rohr Chair in Political Science at the University of Gothenburg for a little while more. Uh, and he's also, which I'm very happy, affiliated with the Institute. Uh, he got his PhD in political science from Lund in 86 with uh, quite a number of supervisors, I understood. Very interesting, with Leonard Lundqvist, Joran Terborn and Gunnar Olofsson. Uh, and he, he did work uh, at uh, the Department of Government at Uppsala University for a long time. And he also held a position at Oxford University at the Blavatnik School of Government and Nuffield College. And before going back to uh, Gutenberg. And he has had visiting position at many, many places, such as uh, in, uh, Australian National University, Cornell, Harvard, Russell Sage, Stanford and Washington. And of course, he's very well known for his research on the quality of government and on corruption. Uh, clientelist, social justice, welfare and policies, and uh, has published a number of books. Uh, I will, there are so many, so I will only mention a few. And uh, one of the recent ones that I warmly recommend, Making Sense of Corruption, uh, with Aisha Verac at Cambridge University Press, and uh, also the Call the Government, Corruption, Social Trust and Inequality in International Perspective at the uh, University of Chicago. And uh, also just institutions matter, uh, which is Cambridge University Press. And today, Bo will speak about uh, another topic that he and I have for a long time been very interested in. Uh, a little bit of a failure. We, we've been trying to make this a big topic in Sweden. I, I think Bo will agree that we kind of completely failed with that, but we're still we're not giving up. Why no economic democracy in Sweden? A counterfactual approach. Bo, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you very much, Gustav, for this very kind and generous introduction. I'm utterly happy to be invited to this seminar at the Institute. Actually, the book you mentioned, Just Institutions Matter, was partly written as an assignment from the Institute many, many years ago by your former, 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 former uh, uh, director. <laughs> so I'm very glad for this. Yes, this is... Uh, thing I have been dealing with for a very long time. This is, of course, a central question for an empirical researcher like I, if, if it actually works. And what you can say is that, uh, although I have not done this research at all myself, looked at companies, the, the people who have done it, and they are quite many now, uh, they show that such companies have, they have been studies now for almost four decades. And economically, they perform well. Actually, they on average outperform when it comes to productivity and sales and growth uh, companies that are governed by outside capital owners. The productivity is high. They pay somewhat, not very much, but somewhat higher wages. One of the most important things is that uh, the people who work there usually uh, get much, much higher pensions through that they also get dividends from their um, from the shares, from the capital that is in operation. And uh, it's very clear that people that work in such companies are, are more satisfied and engaged in in with uh, with their work. So so far so good. Uh, let's see. So, hmm. why am I interested in, in economic democracy? Well, I take inspiration from two persons. One is Robert Dahl, who is, you can say, the, the big name. He's no longer with us, but the big name in, in uh, liberal democratic theory in political science. And interestingly enough, he argued that from a liberal democratic perspective, there were no reason to shy away from a discussion of, of economic democracy. And he argued uh, quite eloquently that 
the important thing was to to do this experimentally and uh, he was also to some part inspired by a person that I will mention later on, uh, David Ellerman. The other person is um, very much with us, <laughs> it's Isabel Ferraras. And she has written a book about this, and she's argued that we should go for economic democracy through introducing a bicameral system. So employees would have one chamber, and the owners would have one chamber. And she takes this from how democracy was introduced, uh, political democracy. She and five female colleagues have had an enormous success in an op-ed article they wrote in March. It's been published, I think, in, in 47 major international newspapers in 20 languages and so for this. So uh, she is uh, also a big inspiration here, although... I'm not very convinced about her idea of bicameralism, but, but uh, it's a little on the agenda. However, in my profession, political science, it's a completely dead thing. Uh, if you take the annual review of political science, uh, that I'm actually on the board of this publication, and I tried to convince my colleague that we should have at least one article about this, but no, I failed. But in the more than 500 articles since they, this is publication started in 19, I think, 94, there is not one single article about this. If you take the flagship um, publication, the American Political Science Review, that is usually ranked as number one, there is nothing during the last two decades. Uh, at my department, we have a very successful and a very impressive a program uh, known as the Varieties of Democracy that is led by my esteemed colleague Stefan Lindberg that has a, had a, a huge uh, uh, success in, in, in measuring and theorizing democracy. But also they do not take up economic democracy at all. And if you go to Swedish political science, there was a dissertation at my department here, but it's 25 years ago. So the, the question doesn't exist in, in political science, you could say. So this is um, Dahl's argument for economic democracy. It's a long quote, but he says, work is central to the life of most people. For most people, it occupies more time than any other activity. It affects often decisively their income, consumption, savings, status, friendship, leisure, health, security, family life, old age, self-esteem, self-fulfillment, well-being, personal freedom, self-determination, self-development, and innumerable other crucial interests and values. Ah, of all the relations of authority, control, and power in which people are routinely involved, none are as salient, persistent, and important in the daily lives of most persons as those they are subject to at work. What government have such immense consequences for daily life as government of the workplace? Where could despotism work its effect more insidiously? So he was very outspoken here in the late 1980s about the importance of that we think about economic democracy. I have also personal experience here. I was for four years in the uh, research Council of the National Board for Social Insurance in Sweden. And uh, I and my colleague had to decide about giving research money for uh, research applications. And I must have read like 400 <laughs> of them. And uh, many of them, maybe most, were about this problem of uh, increasing burnout, uh, psychological problem, mobbing, harassment, and so on. It was very clear for me that there were lots of people who felt that they were not disrespected, they were not taken seriously, they had no influence in their workplace, and this actually made them very sick. So I think there are good arguments for this. Well, Gustav Müller is very interesting. He sent to the Finnish civil war, the gruesome Finnish civil war in 1918 by the Social Democratic uh, Party, his then party secretary, to try to find a solution. And he, he it, it fails and the war goes on. 
But he draws the conclusion that it's absolutely central that uh, the struggle for socialism is subordinated to the democratic principles. He thinks that uh, his social democratic colleagues or party friends in fin Finland are doing a very responsible and stupid thing, and it ends in a miserable a defeat for them. But he's also interesting when it comes to socialism. He's actually a very in inspiring socialist thinker. And one thing he says in 1920 is that it's we'll, we have to think carefully about this because it wait, will make no sense to have the high-level civil servants in the state run the enterprises. The enterprises should be autonomous and, and self-governed, uh, uh, is his idea. Rosselli is also very interesting. Rosselli is actually the one who coins the word uh, or the term liberal socialism. He uh, is a socialist and is equally appalled by the failure of the Socialist Party in 1919 to take a, a, a responsible position in the almost civil war that goes on in Italy in 1919 and that then paved the way for fascism. He is, um, becomes a strong anti-fascist uh, opponent. He is uh, pre in, put in prison by Mussolini. He writes this book in prison uh, 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 and in 19, uh, uh, let's say 1929, yeah. Then he flees to, 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 uh, to France where he becomes a very, very important anti-fascist organizer. Uh, his ideas are the same as Muller's. You have to absolutely subordinate socialists to the democratic principles, to liberalism. And he's also arguing that the socialist production has to be carried out not by the state. He's very critical of what goes on in the Soviet Union, for example, but by autonomous uh, um, uh, enterprises, corporations. So he's the first one who, who writes uh, this little strange term, liberal socialism, and try to connect them. He, the reason uh, nothing comes out of it is that uh, Rosselli is murdered by uh, uh, Mussolini's French agents in 1937. Muller uh, is dethroned. He was sure, and many were sure, he would become party leader in 1946, but he's dethroned by the next generation who is not interested in socialism, but want to build a very strong welfare state. Okay, next. Yeah, so Sweden, why is Sweden a counterfactual puzzle? Well, Sweden is first a very democratic country. It, democracy is ba ba basically the religion here. There are lots of producer and consumer cooperatives in the country, housing uh, uh, cooperatives, uh, many in, in the agricultural industry. There is a very vibrant civil society, lots of very active voluntary organizations. The country has a very high level of social trust. There is a strong union movement that programmatically is in favor of economic democracy. It's in their program. As you know, we have a strong social democratic party, but there are very, very few such companies in Sweden. And there is no big um, sort of a showcase company uh, that is governed by their employees, such as Mondragon in Spain, or the John Lewis companies in the UK, or the Publix company that currently employed 200,000 people in the United States. And there is, uh, uh, according to the European Union, who investigates this, Sweden has the, the worst institutional support structure for such companies. So uh, the, the, it's very strange why we don't have them, because the, Sweden should have been fertile ground for such companies. So this needs to be explained. Next. Yeah. <laughs> We have many more such companies in Spain, Italy, the UK, and especially in super capitalistic United States. Currently, about 10 million employees work in what is known as such ESOP company. They, it's about 10% of the workforce, 7,000 companies, 
of which 4,000 are majority controlled by the, by the employees. And what is uh, interesting is that employees in the United States, uh, due to this ESO program, can buy companies with the future profits as security, thereby not risking their own money. This is legally not possible in Sweden. Uh, it's also very interesting that this uh, has very strong support both from the Republicans and the Democrats. Actually, uh, one of the most eloquent um, uh, supporters of the ESOP movement is now a close advisor to President Joe Biden. Next, please. So the first explanation I hear, have, and this is quite surprising, the unions in Sweden are very much against economic democracy. Let me take a personal experience here. In 2006, uh, both uh, uh, Saab and Volvo were in deep trouble in my part of Sweden. And uh, especially uh, the Saab people, both the unions and the, the, the management came public and said, we have everything to be successful. We have the models, we have the knowledge, we have the market, we have the technology, we have everything. The only thing we need is a new owner. And it was basically the same message from, from Volvo. And so I wrote an open article in our newspaper, he said, where I said basically, if everything what you say is correct, and I have no reason to doubt this, what is this new owner going to contribute with? No new technology, no new markets, no new uh, knowledge, no nothing. It's just capital. So why don't you go to the big pension funds and other uh, 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 capital agencies and just borrow the money if what you say is correct? The next day I got two phone calls, both from the civil engineers uh, union uh, people at both Volvo and, and Saab. And especially at Volvo, they said, yeah, we have actually tried this. We have actually uh, uh, put up a special organization for making such a bid, but it cannot work at all here. Why? Because the blue color metal workers union even doesn't even want to talk about it. They say, absolutely no. So now Saab doesn't exist, and Volvo Cars is owned by a Chinese big capitalist with close connection to the Chinese Communist Party. Not a very democratic organization, I think. Next, please. I also, when I published a, and edited a book a number of years ago, I did a, a small experiment, one of my assistant turned a fake union member, and she made calls to the central union asking for help to establish a worker cooperative when the local municipality or city wanted to privatize a public service, for example, a school, a daycare center, or elderly care And next, please. All four unions responded that this was not their business at all, and that the member should turn to an employer's organization for support. Next, please. The result of this is very few employee cooperatives in public services have been established in Sweden. Instead, many are now operated by for-profit driven risk capitalist corporations. So, what we have is that the public sector unions here missed a golden opportunity to establish economic democracy. Next, please. Here we have two people. This first picture is Richard B. Freeman, one of the world's leading labor economists, professor at Harvard uh, and, and with tons of publications here. And the other one is Carl Peter Tuvaldson, the chairman, former chairman of the, the Swedish Blue Color Union. Next, please. Uh, in 2015, Freeman uh, uh, wrote a report that was commissioned by the Swedish Blue Color Union uh, about uh, 
this model for profit sharing. It's a very good report. He makes all the good arguments why such companies works very well. He makes all the good arguments why such a model would contribute to a, a decrease in economic inequality. He also shows that this could be a very new, interesting way for the union movement that has been losing members and, and, and uh, steam for a long time. And I, I actually read this report for the first time about uh, eight weeks ago or something. And I, so I emailed uh, Freeman and asked, so what was the response from Ello from this report you wrote? And Freeman wrote me back the next day saying he got a very polite but very clear answer from Carl Peter Tuvelson. It read, we are never going to do this. And you have to ask why. And in the paper, I present two arguments. Both are lessons from organizational theory. One is that the organizational interests for, uh, are more important than the ideology for the unions. By this, I mean that they are afraid that they would lose power in such a situation where their members would actually be the ones who were running or at least appointing the ones who were running their companies. And then you have what I call organizational learning or a kind of trained incapacity. The union officials in Sweden have become utterly skilled in playing on the very complicated and complex and huge, huge system in Sweden of industrial relations laws. This is work safety relations and, and laws about who can be fired and when about uh, uh, working conditions for uh, and so on and so they have they, they have trained not to take sort of the the responsibility for the company they are play the always the adversarial game so they are sort of against this idea that that m most of their knowledge sort of their sunken costs would would become pretty I wouldn't say useless, but not very valuable if such a model would be established. So the unions are in Sweden are clearly against this, at least the blue collar unions, I should say. Next, please. This has a long story, actually. In 1920, when the, the chairman of the Metal Workers Union was a member of the then Social Democratic Government Committee on Industrial Democracy, and he argued strongly against co-determination council because this would, he, in his thinking, hurt the unions. In 1973, when one of the very few ESOP type programs were established, and it is in one of the largest banks, the Svenska Handelsbanken, the bank employee union was against. The system, I should say, now pays about 2.5 million US dollars equal to all employees when they retire after about 30 years in the bank. But the unions were against, they didn't want it. Next, please. So my second explanation is that the political left has had a huge misunderstanding of the relation between markets and capitalism. The companies that have been studied and that I'm talking for all work in market economies, of course. And my argument is that markets are not capitalists. Markets are much older than capitalists. The alternative to the market, the centrally planned production and nationalization of industries have been tried. And I have to say with very little success. Uh, I would like to point out an uh, interesting philosopher, Elizabeth Anderson, who has written about this. And she says, she has a sentence say, markets were once left. It was the left people in the early 19th century uh, who were in favor of markets. And then we have one of my other favorites, Ferdinand Brodel from the Annal School of History. And he presented many, many years ago in the early, I think late 1980s, a theory about the difference between capitalism that he thought of as control and monopoly. And markets, he says, are openness, transparency, competition, and liberation. Next, please. 
So it's also the case that markets are neither built on self-interest, utility, maximization, economic man, nor do they generate this type of behavior. I refer to a very interesting experiment showing that the more groups are market-oriented, the more they will trust in what is known as experimental prisoners' dilemma games. Well-functioning markets are actually built on trust because formal contracts usually cannot be complete, and they also generate trust. This is both social trust and institutional trust. So this idea that the left and the right have had, that sort of the left saying markets will generate uh, uh, self-interest, rent-seeking, utility maximization, and the right says they are built on it. Both, both are wrong, I think. Next, please. What if this view of market is right? This is the famous Marxist Immanuel Wallerstein when he reviews Brodel's theory. This is what he say. If Brodel is right, the policy implications for the contemporary world are massive. If capitalism, real capitalism, is monopoly and not the market, real market, then what is to be done is a question that may be answered very differently from the ways in which anti-systemic movements have been answering it for the past 100 years. And I agree. Next, please. The second misunderstanding is that both the left and Marx and the right, Milton Friedman, argue that the right to control the production, the enterprise, the firm of the corporation, comes from the ownership of the capital that is used for the production. This is a very serious, complete, and fundamental misunderstanding of economic power in a market economy. Next, please. This is a true genius, David Elliman. He's an American economist. He's worked uh, as advisor to the World Bank uh, president, um, uh, and uh, he has constructed what I call the the theory, the contract theory. He says, power does not come from ownership, but from the construction of the renting contract. When labor, that is the workers, and capital, the capital owners, meet in the marketplace, it is not legally preordained which way the rental contract will be made. Capital may hire labor, labor may hire capital, or some third party may hire both labor and capital. The direct control of rights over the use of the capital and the labor in the production are determined by the direction of the rental contract, by whom hires whom. And I think this is utterly important. So all of us in this seminar could, of course, tomorrow start a company, say a publishing house, and we would go to some bank or pension fund and, and get the loan, that is, rent the capital to, to, to make this happen. Then it's we, not the owners of capital, who decides about how to organize the production. So this idea that, that it's the, its power comes from owning, it cannot be correct. It's obviously false. Next, please. This is um, an article I wrote in 1984. <laughs> in Swedish, I call it uh, 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 um, Postponing after the socialist on flit à la recherche du socialiste perdu. And I, I cite myself here, the basic principle in this model is that it will no longer be the possession of capital that gives dominating power in the relations of production. The connection between owning capital and the right to command the organization of the production will simply be dissolved. What is nowadays termed shares will be transferred to bonds. A transition to socialism thus, thus does not mean a transfer of capital power from one group to another, but the real abolition of the power of capital in the production. So I hadn't read uh, Elman then, so we came about with the same idea about the same time. So it's a little interesting. Uh, and th this has happened one more time, I should say. Next, please. Oh, oh, we can skip this. 
this is a mistake. Next, please. This, I will argue, is to some extent already happening that shares are becoming bonds. Now, if you own share, and if you own the majority of a share in a company, you, you have capital power, yes. But 85% of the Swedish publicly traded stocks are not owned by capitalists, but by institutions, pension funds, managed funds, etc. And the large majority of owners of shares now, they have no interest or competence in wielding any power in the production. And now we have a new thing that very few people, at least in Sweden, have, have, have thought about. There is a huge increase in index funds that own shares. Now, index funds are very different from managed funds because they do not make any decisions where to put the money. They just use a robot or an algorithm and spread the, the money all over the place on the stock market and follow the index. And the index funds have become very, very popular because it turns out that the managed funds, those guys who try to pick the winners, they lose. The last 10 years, the average managed funds have been beaten by the index funds in the United States. The index funds have gone from owning about 10% to 25% of the stock market in the US. In Sweden, it, there is a very interesting discussion now in one of the business journals where the people who are operating managed funds are very angry at the index funds because the index funds do not take any responsibility for stewardship for the companies. The managed funds do this, at least in Sweden, by taking a lot of interest and being active in, in selecting people to the board. But the index funds, they refuse, they're not interested. So what we see here is with the index fund revolution is that capital is in reality abdicating from running the corporations. And this we have to theorize much more and look into much more, but this is a new and very, very interesting development. Next, please. My third explanation for why we do not see such companies in Sweden is the miserable failure of the word wage earner funds. As many of you know, they were established in Sweden in 1983 by the Social Democrats under strong pressure from the blue color unions after a long and very bitter political fight. One effect was that this fight mobilized very much the political right and it politicized the business community that started to fund several neoliberal think tanks. Before that, the uh, sort of uh, employers' federation were more like a national authority. They were not very into politics, but now it changed. The funds were abolished by a center conservative government in 1992. After 1992, when the Social Democrats have been back in government many times, they have never suggested to reestablish the funds. Instead, this defeat has led to a ban within the left to even talk about economic democracy. It's very clear that you cannot even speak, use the word fund, or so people will not listen to you or if you speak about economic democracy. So this, this defeat has had several and very bad uh, effects on the whole discussion of economic democracy. Next, please. What was then wrong with the funds? Please. It was never clear what the policy would imply for workers in the firms where the funds had shares. It was not clear how firms where the funds own shares would differ from other firms in how they operated. It was not clear how to handle the eventual injustice for those union members working in firms where the funds did not own any shares. There were not clear what the benefits would be for the individual workers. The, the, Blue Collar Union and the Social Democratic Party said absolutely no to any individual benefits in, in terms of money from the funds. But I think the most important thing here is that 
The whole wage earner fund idea was based on the genuine capitalist logic and idea that it is the owning of capital that should give the right to power in the production. And as I've argued before, this is this is not how it should work. This is this is a complete misunderstanding of power and capital in a market economy. Next, please. So let me summarize. Economic democracy works. We know that. Sweden should have been a very fertile ground for such companies, but this has not happened. The first reason, opposition from the unions. I think I've actually found an historical paradox here. The stronger the unions are in a country, the less likely are we to see economic democracy. I should also say, I try to get uh, some of the business think tanks interested in this idea, because in the US, this is not a politically controversial thing. Also, the Republicans are interested. But it's very hard to even get them to talk about this. It's very obvious for me that the, the business research community and think tanks, uh, there are several of them in Sweden, they are actually not the first priority is not a very successful uh, market economy because then they would have been interested in this company. Their first priority is the interest of capital owners. Yeah, the second reason is the left's complete misunderstanding of the relation between markets and capital. And the third is the political defeat of the wage earner fund policy that created a ban. It's very clear, for example, from the excellent uh, documentary movie that Patrick Vikovsky has produced that is available on YouTube when he interviews the head economist of the Blue Collar Union. It's very clear that this is what he says. After the defeat of the wage earner fund policy, we do not dare even to talk about this. Next, please. Yes, is there a future for economic democracy? I think so. Politically, this idea is getting increased support, not least in the United States, but also in Britain, for example, and in Italy. And as I mentioned, one of the foremost promoters of this model is now a close advisor to President Biden. But it will not happen through the mobilization of the industrial working class. This is Mark's second big mistake. Uh, this idea makes absolutely no sense. It's never been the case that the subordinated social class has created the new society. It was not the slaves that created feudalism. It was not the, the, the peasants, despite endless uh, uproars that created capitalism. It's always been a new class with the new logic of production that has created the new economy. I think it's to some extent already happening in the most advanced areas of the production, the knowledge economy. If the employee's knowledge is the most important asset in the production, capital will lose power to the employees. Just to take one in example of this, three years ago, six very successful uh, um, owners or business leaders in what is known as the new economy, uh, uh, the new knowledge economy, young, young people, they wrote an op-ed article in the uh, leading Swedish daily newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, uh, what demands they had for for, from the, the government. And their first demand, the first demand was this, it must become easier to make our employees co-owners. And why is this? Because they need their engagement, they need their support, they need uh, their knowledge, and they cannot command this saying, I own the capital, so I know what is going to be done in this company, because that is not how, how it works nowadays. Yes. Is there one more? No. Yes, this was what I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bo, for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, and uh, also in a bit tricky circumstances. 
Now, uh, we'll take a five-minute break before we start the question and answer period. So we will reconvene at, uh, uh, at three minutes to uh, three o'clock. Okay, it's time to start the question and answer period. So welcome back, everybody. I'll just say something how we run this. Uh, we will use the chat function, so you can uh, send your question in the chat or also in uh, slido.com if you want to do that. And that's, uh, you use the code 56007, 56007. And since we are a mix of research from different fields, we asked to tell you your area of study so we can uh, make sure that we take questions from different disciplines. Uh, it's, it's, that's quite a nice mix. So if you want to ask a question, you write your name and area of study in the chat. And for example, Gustav, philosophy, if I ask the question. And we also uh, do follow-up questions. So we do uh, main questions and follow-up questions. And then you just write follow-up and then the name of the person you want to follow up to. Uh, and follow-ups then are taken before new questions. And when it's your turn, I will call upon you and you will put, so to say, in the spotlights so that your video and sound become available to the audience. And you can then ask a question out loud. So that's we start with. And uh, we do have already one question from uh, Pontus. So can we take uh, Pontus in the spotlight? There we are. Hey, this is really interesting stuff. I was wondering, so you were talking about the role of, of education in seeing how companies shift to this. Uh, and I think a noticeable trend, at least within large technology firm, is that they give out stocks to high skilled employees, but not to all their employees. Mm. So, so they might be moving towards a partial democracy in the sense that not everyone gets get gets to partake in the profits on the company. Not everyone gets a, a, a stock option, but only only some. More liking to the early democracies uh, where only the rich people got to vote. And I was wondering how do you view these intermediate cases? Yes, I, there are many, many ways to organize this uh, economic democracy. There are countless problems to solve. Like, for example, how do you do with retiring people? They, they are no longer working. Should they still owe uh, shares in the company, for example? There are solutions to all these problems, but they are usually not very well known. Uh, for what you say here, I th there are one parallel, and that is, Many firms that uh, are run by, for example, architects or uh, lawyers, they have a system that it takes a number of years until you become a full member. It's like uh, an academic department. It takes, say, six years until you are uh, 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 get tenure in a way. So that is that is one one way to think about it. You you you. Uh, the, the very first day you come into the business as a junior person, it makes a little sense that uh, you cannot have the same uh, voting power as people who have worked there for 15 years and are much more senior and so. But I, I think the solution to this is to uh, is to to think of it like a political democracy. Uh, it, you know, yes, first the rich people were voting, but then there came demand that everyone should have the right to vote. Okay. So I think that that would be that would be the parallel to me. Uh, uh, that of course they are more willing to give money to the uh, dividends or, or shares to to the to the more highly skilled or more important people. I think the system at Handelsbanken that I mentioned is very interesting because it based only on years. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, when uh, a janitor in the bank uh, after 30 years gets the same from this uh, fund they have as the CEO, uh, and it's big money, it's, uh, they don't want to talk about it, but I, I figured out it's about 18 million Swedish kronas, you know, that comes when you're 63 year old or something. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so that is one way that you differentiate between the money you get and the the, the voting power you have, or the the power here. So, so I guess to be specific, if if we think that the companies that move to it often do so for high educated employees, 
you're not worried that we would get the, a further increase in difference between the middle class and the working class. So the lawyers you talk about, they get in after a certain number of years, but the secretaries at those law, law firms never become partners. That's true. That's true. No, I mean, I think of this as, uh, you know, if you take political democracy, it's uh, easy to come out with 10 dimensions that can vary. So you can have presidentialism or parliamentarism, bicameralism or one chamber, endless uh, referendums or no referendums, strong local government, weak local government, strong judicial review, no review. So, and, and uh, I don't know how to say it in English. Two, two, uh, <laughs> two, uh, it's 1048 ways of organizing democracy. So uh, I think it's very important that we realize that this will look very different in different branches, in different sectors, for different skilled people. But for example, uh, in this book that we published, Lars Lindqvist, have studied uh, uh, dental care in Sweden that used to be public, but were then given over to the to the employees. And he shows that that it works democratically. That the 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 very quite low educated, I don't know the under nurses <laughs> uh, and the, and the, the very skilled dentists they have the same influence and they are all very happy with this it works from uh, Malcolm Fairbrother sociology can we put Malcolm in the spotlight Malcolm you should be on the spotlight there you are I see him. You should see put you, on the mic. Oh, I have to do it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, no, I hear you. Hello, great. Michael. Hi. Um, so I support your pursuit of this topic very much and enjoyed your talk in many ways. But unless I just missed them, there were two words that I didn't hear in your talk, which I thought should have been there. Uh, sociology and Polanyi, as in Karl Polanyi. Uh, and you pointed out the deficiency of political science on this topic, but sociology has had a great deal to say about this topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, you should look, for example, at the work of uh, the, the late Eric Olin Wright on real utopias and things of that sort. But I'll just ask a question about my, my second word, Polanyi. And you seem to be sort of saying something similar to Karl Polanyi that... Um, maybe we should be sort of using markets in a democratic way or subordinating markets to society in a sense. Uh, you know, that's his argument, I guess. Are you in fact saying something similar to that or, or do you see yourself sort of diverging from Polanyi in some notable way? I must confess it's many, many years since I read Polanyi. <laughs> so I, ha I have to go back and see when it comes to right, he mentions this, but he he hasn't developed it. He says, yes, there can be companies like this. But then he also supports one of the, I think, most irresponsible, unimplementable and unethical ideas, and that is this universal basic income. So he, he, he puts everything on the table. I don't. I put one thing on the table, and that is uh, this type of economic democracy. But uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not a market fundamentalist. I think markets needs to be regulated for consumer interest, for environmental interest, for all kinds of interests. So I'm, I don't think there could ever be an unregulated market. But I, I'm, I think it's very important that we learn to distinguish that capitalism is one thing and markets are another thing. Uh, uh, capitalism is a system where those who owe capital have the power in the relations of production. Then socialists must be, and that is why I call myself a liberal socialist, socialists must be the opposite. It's when those who work at the enterprise or firm have this power. Now, I, I don't think this is paradise, but you know, uh, ordinary democracy is also not paradise. <laughs> like I have basically a Churchillian view of this. It's not a very good system, but and, uh, all the alternatives are worse. And, and it's already happening. You can, you can see that 
what is happening now with these index funds is that the managers, in Platon's word, you know, the guardians, the experts are taking all the power. And the, the index funds have no clout in controlling them. So they are rewarding themselves more and more and more with all those ridiculous bonuses. But there, this will raise the fundamental question, who should guard the guardians if not the capitalists keep them in check? Then it seems quite logical that the employees are doing this. Actually, you can read about this in the most unexpected publications now, like Harvard Business Review, for example. That that they say this this system is not working because no one is is controlling uh, the the leading managers, and this is also what you see economically. You know, if you go back fifty years ago, maybe they were paid ten times an industrial worker. Now they are paid a hundred times. So this is what happened. They they have a Christmas Eve because capitalism doesn't work. The capital owners are not there anymore. Thanks for your thoughts. I'll let you move on to the next questioner. Okay, so I'll, I'll then do a little follow-up uh, because Bo was a bit modest there, not uh, telling you that uh, only two weeks ago he actually gave this talk in this uh, real utopia conference in the memory then of Eric Olin Bright, so, uh, where also Ferreira was. So, uh, of course, uh, we have had lots of discussion with Eric Olin Bright about this before he unfortunately... Uh, died. But a follow up on that, uh, uh, talking about this, uh, following to Malcolm here. I mean, you mentioned both that uh, there are Republicans in favor of this, and that's correct. But what you didn't mention in the talk is why big capitalists, in the sense of uh, those who own uh, firms and make a lot of money, like the Koch brothers or you know, uh, uh, the Rothschild in olden times. Why would they be in favor of this? I mean, this will diminish their power and their uh, profits. I don't think that the Wallenbergs or the Cook brothers will be very much in favor of this. No, I'm not that naive. But there is an interesting tendency to my big surprise. Uh, I have been approached by uh, civil servants in Sweden who work at the county councils as um, people, uh, bureaucrats trying to develop the, the, the business community, very much in, in sparsely populated areas. And what they say uh, uh, is, uh, and I also have this very much from my collaborate on this, Patrick Witkowski, what they say is that the country, Sweden, and it's the same in the United States, there are very many mid-sized companies where the owner is now 60 plus. Now, he absolutely don't want to sell the company. He's tired, so he want to retire. They absolutely don't want to sell to a risk capitalist. He doesn't want to sell to, to, to one of his competitors. And so he would like to, to, to sell it to, to the employees. But in Sweden, this is impossible because then the employees would have to take a big personal risk. In the United States, not. This is one of the things that, that happens quite a lot in the United States, that, that these people, and of course they could give it to their sons or daughters, but usually their sons and daughters are ballet dancers in Paris or uh, artists in New York, and so they have absolutely no interest in taking over this uh, 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 standard firm in, in a sparsely populated. So, And they are very, very worried because there are many such firms that will disappear if you cannot solve this problem. So mid-sized capitalists will be in favor, can be in favor. That's very clear from the United States. But the big capitalists, of course, but they, they are becoming less and less important. If you look at who actually 85% of the voting power, not the voting power, but the shares at the Swedish Stock Exchange are not owned by this type of capitalists. They, no, they, they, they are becoming less and less important. That's okay, but you would agree that uh, these uh, big capitalists have rather much influence over the Republican Party, so there might be a small problem there. 
Yeah, but the, the, the ESOP system is not challenging that. I, I'm not arguing that this should be, you know, a big bang one day change <laughs> from one day to another. I think this, this will have to take time, of course, like the move from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, 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 but we have to see, I mean, we cannot be like the, the radical social democrats now in Sweden with their class theory that they, they, they see the future that we should go 40 years back. <laughs> it makes, I mean, this, this uh, catalyst class project, it's, it makes absolutely no sense to me. What they want is that Sweden should become like in the 1980s again. That will not happen. What we have to see is what is actually happening in the economy and what can be a progressive sort of twist in, in taking advantage of what is already happening. And you seem to disagree with your former supervisor, Joran Therbon, who's running this Catalyst project. But uh, we, we know, can we, discuss that we, more. Yeah. <laughs> He's a very skilled, fantastic sociologist, but this is not his game. So now uh, the next question is from Emma. Hi. Thanks. Um, I have two comments. Uh, yeah, if you move, uh, can you move so you can uh, see right. the camera? Yeah. So the first one was, uh, I was expecting um, uh, the name Piketty to come up be uh, because I think, you know, people are discussing his work in terms of return on capital versus return on work or labor. And then you could sort of, you know, piggyback on that discussion if you want to promote this thought. So that's uh, an idea. Or if you have some other, you know, comments on the link between your work and his books. And the other uh, comment I had was on uh, the tech sector in the United States wh I'm interested in. And uh, it's, n it's interesting to note that employees in these big companies are having a say in, in a lot of interesting matters, such as like banning yeah. Donald Trump from Twitter and, and Google's collaboration with NSA. So that's an effect of, of employees. Uh, and I'm I'm interested in your thoughts on you know maybe the tech sector could somehow be pioneering or an interesting example somehow, and uh, that was that was it. Thanks. Yeah, about Piketty, his book are too thick for me. <laughs> if you cannot you know make an argument on two hundred and fifty pages, it's something wrong with you. No, of course I recommend I uh, Jesper Roy in a summary on 100 pages. Can yeah, you do I that one? But my reading of his is he has no idea of how about to change the enterprises, the power in the enterprises. His idea, and this is also this uh, uh, class project that got a lot of attention, is increasing taxes and public spending. I'm, I'm not against this, but I pose two questions. Will it be possible to get a political majority for this in our part of the world? Probably not. Will it be enough to do something against this enormously increase in economic inequality? Absolutely not. I think, and, and I think we, we have a very strange situation now. Four big international economic organizations that never used to care much about inequality, the World Bank, the OECD, the IMF, and even the World Economic Forum, all are now saying that the level of economic inequality in our part of, parts of the world is no longer socially sustainable. So they, uh, and I agree, but I'm pretty sure that given what has happened to wages and given what has happened to what comes out from owning capital, if ordinary people do not get also money from, from, from capital, you cannot do anything really about economic inequality. Wages have gone up, yes, 27%, but the stock market price has more than doubled, 200% over the last 15 years. So I, I, I think you have to do that. Then what you say about the tech companies, it's music to my ears. I, I know too little about it, but this is, this is what I expect. 
that that in such an economy, I mean, we used to have a system where the capital owners could go to the firm and say, I own this firm and I know what to do. And now I give orders how to do it. This is absolutely not possible anymore. They have, they, you cannot use this type of power to actually command what is going to be done because all the main asset is not the capital, it's what's in the head of the employees. And that cannot be ordered in that way. Um, okay, just one note. Like, so you're not saying that your proposal here of economic democracy is a way to reduce uh, this uh, uh, the difference between the return on capital versus labor. I mean, it could be like a solution in in a sense to 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 oh, reduce that, inequality. That, that's my main argument. That's oh. my main argument. That in this way, I mean, uh, ordinary uh, uh, bank employee at Hundreds Bank, and when he or she returns, get eighty millions. The 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 cashiers in publics, this big um, supermarket chain that is an ESOP in the United States, when they return, they get about two million, when they retire, sorry, they get about two million uh, dollars. And uh, I can I can recommend, there, there is lots of statistics about it, but the most one of the most interesting things I've read is a report based on interviews with these people. Many are women, many are from minorities, and it's, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. They say, oh, this was the happiest day when I returned and I got all this money because I could pay for my grandkids' uh, uh, college education. The stories never end. So this is, I think, the only serious way if we don't want to do something completely different with our economy and start uh, centrally planned or whatever. This is the only way that you can do something really important. It's not perfect but that you can do something really important about increasing economic inequality. This is, by the way, also one of Richard Freeman's in this report to Ella, one of his main arguments. Thank you. Yeah, I think Emma is along that line, but I think Emma uh, might have meant also that now with this kind of new, uh, especially with uh, new high-tech companies, where you have a lot of productivity gain, which now goes to capital owners, if you have worker-owned companies, you would rather ha have a better share of that and thereby yes. uh, not uh, decrease. So it would be already, not only when you retire, but much earlier than no, that. No, 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 of course not. They also pay higher wages. Next in the spotlight is Fredrik Nordström. Mm. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Ludwig Beckman. Okay, we take uh, Fredrik first then. That was my error. And then Ludwig. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation, Bo. I just have a question. It seems you're talking about the control of the company, either it's sort of employee or it's the capital owners. And they uh, use the control to benefit their own interests, I'd say. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the discussions on, on European Commission. They have a proposal out for a consultation on sus sustainable corporate governance. And... <sighs> In that proposal, it's a little bit different. It's like they are they they want the capital, or sorry, the company or the owners of the company to uh, to put down sort of their own interest and, and take into other interest groups. So either the employee, but not as an intermediary goal to earn more money for the capital owners, more like a, a, a goal at the side of the interest of the capital owners. Mm -hmm. So. In, so the debate has been a little bit about does this mean that it's much more harder to control actually the company and, and also uh, uh, hold someone responsible for, for the management of the company? Do you have, I don't know if you're familiar with the consultation and, and if you have any comments on, on, on the proposals. No, I'm not familiar with it. I, I've been engaged in, in with the World Economic Forum uh, where they try in this corporate social responsibility uh, thinking to to uh, make uh, headway on on corruption, mm. and I've been to several meetings with uh, high level company leaders and so. And my impression is that they actually take this so 
corporate social responsibility seriously. Also, when it, we haven't discussed it but environmentally. So, but still, they have to be, from a political science perspective, accountability is the, is the most important thing. Very few political scientists now believe that, you know, democracy works in the way that the people will is realized through the election process. That's too naive. The best you can hope for is that you can hold those in power accountable. And uh, whom should they be held accountable for? Well, if capital is abdicating to some extent, why shouldn't they, those who run the companies? I will, we will, of course, need skilled uh, uh, managers in the future, but why shouldn't they be held accountable to those who work in the company? And of course, they should be held accountable to, to also uh, concerns about uh, the environment and so on. But I think this, what we have now is uh, unaccountable leaders of big corporations. And this is the problem. No one is actually holding them accountable. So they can reward themselves to absolutely senseless levels, but they, they are also, you know, unchecked. And uh, for a political scientist, the worst thing about power is not power, is unchecked power. <laughs> and that is what we see now. And we have the Enron scandal and many other, the, the British petrol scandal and so on. It goes on forever uh, uh, with, with this problem. So I, I think we have to find, find uh, another, some different type of accountability mechanism than the one we have now also for the big companies. Okay, thank you very much. Send me something about the, the, this, this operation. I, I would be interested to read it, yes. I can do that. Are you satisfied, Fredrik, or did you have a follow-up? No, thank you very much. I, 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 I forgot to tell you that I'm representing the Swedish Investment Fund Association. I really appreciate that you're mentioning the, our, our members' products as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Here. Okay, then we have a question from Ludwig Beckman. Our own Ludwig Beckman, can we put him in the spotlight? Hi, Bo. Nice talk. Hi. Very stimulating. I liked it a lot. I just have one question, one thought that sort of popped up in me when I, when I heard you talking about employer-owned corporations or companies as, a, uh, as an instantiation of economic democracy. I wonder if, it's not, if there isn't reason to keep the idea of uh, employer-owned companies a bit distant from the idea of economic democracy. I mean, they may coincide, but they don't necessarily coincide, I think. I mean, if you, if you have a, a democratic corporation, I, I guess you would, have, you would require, you would expect the employers to, uh, to, to have an equal share in the control of the company and all of them to be, have, a, have that share. They should be equal and inclusive. And also, it should be the case that the employers have exclusive control uh, so that nobody else is actually having a majority stake or something like that in the co in, in the corporation. So, for instance, this uh, often mentioned example of the Octagon and this fund at Handelsbanken. I mean, I think it owns 10% of Handelsbanken in the end. So I, I wouldn't count that as a sort of example of economic democracy in Sweden, really. May maybe it sort of produces incentives for the employers and it, maybe it has very many beneficial effects in, on, on those accounts that you mentioned, but I, I'm not sure it sort of qualifies as democracy, really. So, and, and, and again, also the other example you mentioned, the architects that sort of have partnerships. I mean, that's a very unequal way of distributing, I guess, control in, in minor companies because it takes a while before you get a partner, you, you become a partner and so on. So what do you think about that? So keep, keep, keeping this concept a bit distant and sort of keeping it an op making an open question whether they are actually democratic. Mm. I think what you say makes perfect sense, and uh, that is why I, in the paper, say uh, uh, we these companies can be worker-owned, but they can also be worker-managed, because the logic of elements and my idea here is that you do not have to own the company to govern it. You can hire the capital that is needed. It doesn't have to be your you that owe it. So, so you, you, you should keep these this two things apart, definitely, yes. 
I'm, I'm not arguing that, that the octagonon is, is a perfect democracy, but they are the largest owner of the bank. And nobody can, can, uh, can, uh, can prove this, but they, they got the manager, the CEO, I think two or three years ago, who wanted to close very many of the local offices. offices. And he had to go after three months. And I'm pretty sure why this happened. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm more into pointing at this, that this, is, this type of profit sharing is a way to get ordinary employees, ordinary workers, uh, a, a, a piece of the pie from, from, the, from um, the increasing benefits from capital. So the, it's it's both things, but no, no. It, the Handelsbanken is not a democratically governed system. But it's interesting that, that it was the unions who was against it. That, that 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 was my point because they thought that they would lose power. They're not against it now, of course, but then they were very much against it. Right. Thank you. That answer, Ludwig. Are you happy? What? Are you happy yeah. with the answer? I agree. I mean, we should. Should be kept ownership and democracy should be kept should be kept distant. But the, the nice thing with the Elaman contract idea is that those who governed, if the employees can govern their company without owing it, they can rent the company. More to Ludwig's question there, because uh, as you know, Bo, uh, many people have actually argued that. Uh, with uh, economic democracy in the sense of, of uh, that the workers are governing the firm, you actually get less democracy because really what uh, democracy is about the whole population deciding. And that might be explaining also, I mean, I'm of course on your side when I think that the, the other view is better, but it has been quite a strong view that economic democracy, uh, you get more of that the more that is controlled by a democratically elected government in, in, uh, in a state. And uh, having more uh, uh, governan uh, governance by people working in a firm doesn't increase or might even decrease democracy. And that might explain also when you say the unions, they are against uh, uh, this kind of economic democracy, but uh, they might be very much more in favor of economic democracy, I guess, in the sense of the unions <laughs> controlling more of the companies. So there are, there are these different um, concepts here. That was the idea of the wage on the funds. It didn't go very well. I can tell you one reason that it failed. I, when I was a young scholar in Uppsala, I used to go to the Social Democratic Student Club to listen to, to things uh, sneaking in there. And, and one of the, my memories is when uh, the person, the official from the Blue Color Union who were sort of their main person in constructing the funds, P.O. Dean, he came there and uh, explained uh, 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 when the funds had been established. And uh, the radical social democratic students were very angry with him that they didn't go for uh, the more original, maidener, more radical plan. And he was very frank. He said, I have to admit, the reason that we couldn't do that was we lost our own supporters. If you take Mikael Gilliam's very good dissertation about uh, this, the, this issue, he shows that in the beginning, about 50% of union members supported it. At the end, only 25%. So they basically lost the battle. So as I write in the paper, unions are very organizationally strong in Sweden, but they are, they are, people don't have much confidence in them. Every year we have measured their confidence in unions in, in, at the SOM Institute here since 1986. There is not one year where more people have said they have confidence than don't. They always in the, as we say, cellar, <laughs> below the zero line. So unions are not very popular. People are members of unions because of selective incentives, not because they love the unions at all. Secondly, I think, yes, you can argue that this wouldn't be economic, this wouldn't be democracy. But then why should we have national democracy? Why well, not only a global democracy? Why should, you know, Denmark decide about Denmark? That's completely ridiculous, of course. And we have, we have local democracy. So I, I cannot figure out then the idea that central, if the government would control more of the 
production, that has been tried. Take Britain. If you go back to the 1950s and 60s, the steel industry, the car industry, the coal industry, the airplane, everything was owned by the government. It was basically a semi-socialist society. But do not forget that the main blow to the British left and the, the, the British Union movement was the minor strike that was against a nationalized, nationalized company. It was not against a private company. Don't forget that the big strike in, 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 in the Swedish minefields in the late 1960s was against a nationalized company. It doesn't work. That's a simple thing. It has been tried. It doesn't work. So, so I all agree with that. I was think, trying to point out that there is a kind of ideological battle here in democratic theory where some people going for what we could say the all effective principle think that actually in most cases there will be an increase in democracy if you have uh, worker governance of the firm. But some other uh, candidates, the one proposed by or defended by Ludwig Beckman, for example, then it's all, you only get an increase in democracy, so to speak, if uh, the people who are bound by the laws have a voice on that. In environmental thing, in, in, in discrimination, in, in, in social responsibility, in consumer protection, like we have now. I don't, I don't think that these these companies should be sort of outside the law. Of course, but the idea of Beckman and others is that, well, you should only have this kind of, uh, you only, so say, increase democracy when people who are bound by the laws have a say exactly on the laws they are bound by. And if people are running a company, of course, they are bound by laws, but not more than uh, you and I are or people in other companies. So there is harder to get this kind of support that there is an increase in democracy if you have more control by the people working in the firm. That's what I wanted to point out. So there is a kind of... Uh, in my view, there... there is no such laws that only the people who are bound by them can, can have a say in them. This is not how democracy okay. works. There are no so, such laws. Give me so one that, example. <laughs> that's why uh, on the kind of uh, all subjective principle, like Ludwig's principle, it's not clear that there is an increase in democracy when you have working government firms. That's the point. No, anyone can call anything what they want. I think if you take uh, take um, academics, do we want the state to govern exactly what we teach about and what we do research? Or do we think that there should be a democratic process, how to organize an, ac an academic department? Of course, we can have that. We already have, when it comes to gender studies, that the state is saying, this is a theory you should use. I'm not very fond of this, but maybe Ludwig and you are. Ludwig and I are enemies on this side. <laughs> I'm just taking a devil's okay, position, okay. which has to be no, uh, I, Ludwig. I'm trying to defend the Ludwig anyway. Has, the state has strong arms, but no fingers. Don't forget. And to run a company, you need very much fingers. Uh, we should go to the next question, which I think now is uh, Josef, is that correct? So let's put Josef in the spotlight. Yeah, I think my fantastic presentation was very interesting to hear this from the Swedish side. So from an outside perspective as the German, I have one observation and I want to know what you think about that. And the other one is more a question. So first one is... I mean, you have it pretty much like a power resource type of thing. No, the unions don't want it. The employers don't want it. That's why the thing ain't flying. Now, from a continental perspective, you named all these examples, Mondragon and so on. So, so I, I mean, these all have religious backgrounds, mostly in Catholic third way thinking from the 19th century way back. So there's this huge tradition about this in Italy, Germany, Netherlands, and so on, to do these things. A tradition that I found here completely absent in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you have a vibrant civil society, but you do not necessarily have a very plural vibrant civil society. No? And so my question is, is this something that that has even longer roots, historical, mm -hmm. sociological kind of mm -hmm. you solve the church-state conflict early on, and then there is no big space for mm. something else than the capital labor cleavage, while on the continent this is confluted through this church-state cleavage, and therefore 
the church searches for a freedom in between capital labor. And so they carve out this middle way uh, that you are advocating um, now here. So would it be even even possible remotely? I mean, I, I just can't think that this can like be just like may run here, but maybe I'm wrong. And wouldn't it be nice to write something about the long historical roots of this stuff anyhow? And the second question is, as a, if it would fly, would it be enough? I mean, there was a question before about inequality. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, can you democratize or kind of enable the shareholding in like all these small scale companies where the Swedish lumpenproletariat is working, root Uptrag? type of cleaning janitor companies with five employees that do not exist next year anyhow anymore because the owner has run away to Poland again. Um, and all these type of things. Also the people that are really suffering in this uh, system, can you help them with this if they do not work for a large scale company, but for this small self employed <laughs> Leading also to the question, are there parts of the economy or of the state or civil society that you need to exempt from this possibility, like schools, kindergartens, elderly care? I mean, everything that is somehow vital public infrastructure. I mean, I just can't get my head around that the teachers will just decide as like in the same way as the capitalist owner at the moment to just take out all the money, pay out nice, Christmas bonuses and there will not be any surplus left for the kids that need to learn something there. Just like, that. that's it. To the first question, uh, I think there is no religious backing of the ESOP system in the United States, but you're absolutely sure about uh, Mondragon and Italy. I, I'm lucky enough to spend, um, well, now, not now during the pandemic, but uh, about half the year in a small Italian village. And I'm, I'm a proud member of the uh, Catholic Association of Workers in Italy because they run the bar. <laughs> and so I get cheaper wine. And, and I'm, 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 I'm very surprised how strong this is there, that at the very local level you have all those... Um, uh, civil society organization that have uh, either a former socialist communist <laughs> backing or this Catholic backing. So yes, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There is a long history here that is somehow lacking. I mean, Italy uh, uh, and, 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 and also Germany got, got uh, Catholic unions. We, the, nobody there will not even a uh, a small hint of this in Sweden that uh, the church would do anything here. So you, you're absolutely right that there is a, a strong uh, organizational, we do things ourselves and take responsibility backed by, by, by such organizations, in, especially in, I think, in, in the Catholic parts of, of Europe. Secondly, uh, I think... Um, of course, I mean, there will be companies for which this, this doesn't work. Uh, and I, I, I also argue that um, we have to respect immaterial rights, meaning that if an individual starts a company uh, and he has to employ five people, they cannot decide because the company is his ID. But when he retires, his children cannot inherit the power. You follow me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so so we, if, if you and I would start a, what, a, a, a new uh, an academic or a public journal, and we have a special ID, and we need to employ five people, they cannot then decide what to do. We, we are deciding because we have to respect in such a situation immaterial rights here. Here I differ from David Elliman, who think that employee rights are in, uh, well, are, are absolute. I don't think so. We cannot have the military or the police decide what the military or the police should do, right? When it comes to schools, I think it would work very well. 
uh, uh, and also daycare center and so first you can have a, a you can say that you are not you can make a profit but you cannot pay it out if you uh, uh, if you take the world's most respected educational operations the private uh, elite universities in the United States Harvard Yale Princeton Stanford they go with the surplus but they never gave any money out to any outside owners for the simple reason they don't have any outside owners right so uh, and i think you could have the same system with schools that that you you are allowed to make a surplus you can use it for uh, what a better education for the teachers and so on but but uh, sorry you cannot give money to to take the money yourself so there can be such solutions i think that that would work there are a few not many but a few schools also here in gothenburg run by the by the teachers who are uh, 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 cooperatives they seem to work pretty well but uh, the teachers union doesn't support this at all and that's uh, sangera So thank you very much. This was really en enlightening, and I uh, and I just want to uh, make a comment and ask for your reflections because the question I had was just taken up regarding schools, um, and my comment is based on uh, an uh, illustration you had regarding um, starting a publishing company. So this is related to academic social responsibility. How do you account for the fact that the entire academic establishment is kind of um, has agreed to be reviewers and writers, and and we kind of just leave all our hard work in the in the hands of publishers? Do you do you see some connection with your? Um, your thesis regarding economic democracy as to how we could keep these resources within within uh, the academic establishment and related to that is is a reflection regarding foundations in Sweden like Chalmers and Jönköping that that have a different uh, governance <laughs> Uh, the first, I, I have recently become a big fan of open access. <laughs> I think the profits that these, uh, especially the journals are doing is just historical and they rely on all of our free labors. We, we review for nothing and, and, uh, and we, uh, we um, uh, uh, review books for, you know, uh, uh, Money like this, and so I, 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 I now when I get uh, when I'm asked by rich foundations or national foundations to review research proposals for you know like maybe five million euros or something big big money, <laughs> and, and then they want to pay me like a hundred dollars or something. I say this must be based on a serious mistake. Either you think. I have too little to do, or that I like to work for free. Unfortunately, none of this is true. So I refuse to do this work. And I think we should do that more and more, because this is becoming uh, utterly ridiculous. Uh, what was your second question? I'm getting tired. Yes, say one word. Uh, no, I was just wondering how the... I, I like that uh, response. Yes, that I don't that and... and yes. uh, Sh Shalmers and, well, I, I don't think, uh, for what I understand, the Shalmers, at least here, are n the structure of the foundation is not very democratic at all. It's very much run as a company uh, from from above. Uh, so I don't. I think they are not very good in respecting academic freedom. It used to be the case. If you think of the humble type of university, it was a kind of at least for the professors in an economic democracy. The professors were running the show. Now we, we are in a minority, of course. Uh, and I think this has not been very, very productive. Um, but it's a, it's a little special discussion about, about um, 
uh, collegiality versus uh, ability to change. It's not always the case that collegial structures are very good in handling big changes, no. They can be very conservative. That's my experience. Uh, but on the other hand, what you see in, in uh, for example, the Mondragon uh, uh, big uh, company is that they have been very successful in also uh, handling change. So, uh, yeah, John Shopping, I don't know, but I think Chalmers here is not a good example of, uh, of, of economic democracy or workplace democracy, no. Uh, neither is Gothenburg <laughs> University, for that matter, <laughs> I can say. On that a little bit uh, less pos positive note, I'm afraid we have been running uh, over time. But uh, of course, because it was so interesting and so many questions, I apologize to those who uh, didn't have time to ask questions. I'm sure that Bo is interested in hearing them, so you can contact him. But uh, join me first in uh, thanking Bo for this uh, very, very interesting seminar.